We'd like to welcome everyone today to Central Baptist Church in Woodbridge, Virginia. I'm Pastor Brad Winnegar, and this is a very special day. It is Sunday, December 19th, 2021. It is the Sunday prior to Christmas, and so it is designated as Christmas Sunday here at Central Baptist Church. Welcoming everybody who's here and those who are on their way. And uh, praise the Lord. I know uh, with a lot of Christmas busyness, you may have other things on your heart and mind, but let's focus on Jesus Christ. And I'd like to welcome those folks that are tuning in right now to our broadcast. We've got them all over. The you know, there are people that are getting up hours ahead of us because in their time zone, it is very early. But they're tuning in right now. I'd like to welcome the West Coast and all those around the world who'll be tuning in in the future. We're finding out that Christmas is all about Jesus Christ. If you haven't heard, He is the reason for the season. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Turn to number 201 in your burgundy book. Number 201. Let's all stand up and sing more about Jesus. Sing with me now. More about Jesus would I know. More of His grace to others show. More of His saving fullness see. More of His love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of His saving fullness see. More of His love who died for me. We're singing number 201 in our burgundy hymnal. The words are up there on the screen for all of you. And let's all sing together now that second verse. Singing number 201, the third stanza. More about Jesus in his word. Holy communion with my Lord. Hearing his voice in every line. Making each faithful saying mine. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. Now, everybody take a deep breath. We're going to sing more about Jesus on his throne. Jesus is coming again. He's going to rule and reign a thousand years, sit on the throne of his father, that is ancestor in the flesh, David, and he is going to uh, be the one on the throne. He's the one who deserves all of our praise. Let's sing it together. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Say amen, amen. Good to see folks out. Others will be joining us on this special Christmas Sunday. Let's pray. Father, bless us as we gather. Thank you for those who are tuning in and those who are in attendance today. We thank you for each and every one of our extended Central Baptist Church family. And I pray that you'll be with those that are sick, those that are bereaved, those that are hurting and needy. Help each one, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Turn around and say Merry Christmas to someone and then be seated. Amen. All right. Fantastic. I hope that after the service today, uh, Miss Tina should be back there at the bookstore. And We've got lots of neat things. We've got journals and day planners and calendars for the coming year. You want to get those and Bibles and other special gifts for yourself and for others at this season of the year. I hope you'll do that. Also, 
we have these that we're going to be distributing. They're on uh, the various places. We have them on the, um, uh, on the Welcome Center and on the tables in the back. Everyone look in this way, please. Uh, this particular form is a very special one, uh, prepared uh, in love and, and uh, certainly according to the Scriptures, how to celebrate a godly Christmas. And everybody needs to get these. We'll be distributing them in the morning service, but uh, right now I just want to make you aware of them. As you know, uh, you are uh, generous people. You don't need to be giving uh, gifts uh, to me, though I do appreciate every kindness, every generous thing that's ever been done. But the gifts right now are for Jesus. It's all about His coming to earth. And so let's not forget to give a Christmas gift to Jesus during these days. Between now and the end of 2021, let's give a special offering to Jesus. All right, we've got a kid's song that we're going to ask our big kids as well, our adults, to sing along. Number 210 in your Burgundy book. We're going to sing it twice through. Let's stop after the first time through. I'll give you some special words to sing the second time through. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Let's sing it together. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Now, I know those words are in the book, and those words are up on the screen for those that are viewing at home. But there's a second verse. It goes like this. Jesus to Calvary did go, his love for mankind to show. What he did there uh, brought hope from despair. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. So Jesus to Calvary did go. Jesus to Calvary did go. His love his love for mankind to show what he did there brought hope from despair oh how he loves you oh how he loves me oh how he loves you and me Good singing. Thank you for playing. Amen. And who does he love? Somebody tell me. Who does he love? You and me. That's right. Good to see everybody out today. How many, how many of you are feeling as good as you possibly can feel? Raise your hand. Come on. Being in the house, the Lord does that. And um, praise God for each one who's gotten over what they've, what they've had. They've got through it. Uh, it's not necessarily the Wuhan uh, you know, flu that people have. Some folks just have uh, drippy noses and coughs and different things like that. So it's all kinds of things that people have this season of the year. We want to pray for all of them to get better and be strong and not share it in, uh, in the way that we want you to be contagious. We want you to be contagious with the gospel. But uh, I'm feeling good today. Glad you asked me, okay? Amen. Amen and amen. It is Sunday school, and everybody ought to go to Sunday school. All of you folks out there, I want you to wake up now, open your eyes, and turn with me, if you would please, to a great scripture, which is a Christmas scripture, as we get started. Number uh, Luke chapter 1, verse number 37. Luke chapter 1, verse number 37. As you're turning, let me thank all of you for coming to the auditorium. And we'll be doing this a few more weeks. And then in January, uh, we'll give you the exact details. But we are going to be, we're going to be getting folks uh, separated out to classes. And we're going to try on a trial basis to have Sunday school and a few other expanded activities. Uh, never have shut down. Praise the Lord for that. But we're going to get back to what would be uh, more like what you're familiar with. And it's good to have a Sunday school teacher and a class and, a, you know, 
uh, perhaps a general gathering at the beginning or the end, and, and we're going to do that. We're going to have our kids split out uh, to classrooms and so forth in the future. It's going to be step by step, but just want to let you know. All right, we're in Luke chapter 1, and who, who wrote the gospel according to Luke? It's not a trick question. Luke did. And who was he? He said, well, he was one of the 12 disciples. No, he wasn't. Absolutely wasn't. He wasn't around during the time of the 12 disciples. Luke, as a life's profession, was a doctor. Dr. Luke, he was a physician. And he accompanied somebody very famous on his missionary journeys, and that man's name was Paul. And so this, this man, Luke, wrote the gospel according to Luke. You say, well, how did he know this stuff? He wasn't around when the disciples were around. Well, we know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed it out. So he moved holy men of old to write as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And, and uh, so he wrote down the very words. We have them inspired and preserved for us. So you got nothing to worry about. Now, he wrote another book that hasn't got his name on it. And who knows what the name of that book is. He wrote, Luke wrote another book. All right. It wasn't called Luke's Memoirs. It was called the Book of Acts, A-C-T-S. Acts of the Apostles, actually the Acts of the Holy Ghost through the Apostles, and it is the continuation of the Gospel. So when you get finished with Luke, just go into Acts and you'll be continuing. The same scribe, the same man wrote it down as he was moved by the Holy Ghost. How many of you just learned something today? Raise your hand. All right. So who wrote Luke? Not a trick question. Luke. Who wrote Acts? Luke. That's right. Same answer. That's right. Okay. Which one did he write first? Luke. Which one did he write second? Acts. All right. Okay. Good. All right. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. And this is the angel informing Mary about the very, very, very unusual not miraculous, but unusual and uh, supernaturally uh, helped birth of John the Baptist. And, of course, also she had been told about the coming of the Savior through her. And in verse 37 is a great verse for everybody to memorize in this room. If you've got something you've been praying about that just seems absolutely impossible, this is for you. All right, everybody out there, read it with me also. Luke 1, 37, begin. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Say it again. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. How much is impossible with God? Nothing. That's right. Whatever's in God's perfect will is going to come to pass. And we find out what His will is according to the Word of God. So here... The Virgin Mary is finding out something that's absolutely shocking. You're all old enough to know this, that a normal birth takes a man and a woman. For a baby to be conceived and, and to be born takes a man and a woman. That's a normal birth. And every other birth in history was that way. I got here because I had a mom and a dad, and that's how I got here. And that's how you got here, too. Uh, even if those people aren't all in your life, it took a mom and a dad to get you here. Guess what? In Jesus' case, he had a human mom, but he had a heavenly father. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost. And we're going to be pointing out some very neat things that the scriptures say or indicate in the morning service about that miraculous conception and birth. The virgin birth is absolutely necessary because the way you and I, we all have a sin nature, and the way we got it, we got it from our dad. Everybody did. Uh, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And that one man back in the beginning was Adam. The Bible says so. And Adam passed it along to his kids, and all of the males passed it along to their kids, and all the males passed along to their kids. Now, don't be blaming the males because uh, it was a joint effort on the part of Adam and Eve. Uh, uh, Adam, Adam should have known better. Eve didn't know, but they both sinned. They both succumbed to temptation. And because of 
Adam's sin, we all have that Adam's nature. It's called Adamic nature. We have that Adam's nature, that sin nature. When we get old enough to know the difference between right, wrong, good, and evil, guess what? We sin accountably. So I don't know how old you were, but I think I was probably four or five, and I knew the difference between right and wrong. I knew I wasn't supposed to take that stuff, but I did. Took something that wasn't mine. Anybody ever snitch uh, a, or snatch a cookie that wasn't yours? Raise your hand. Come on. You took one that wasn't yours. Shame on you. Shame, 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 shame. Now, that's sin. Anybody ever get mad with mom, dad, or big brother, big sister, and think mad thoughts? Raise your hand. That's sin. That's sin. That is. Anybody ever not come the first time you were called? That's sin. Disobedience, rebellion, sin, that's all because we have the same great, 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 continuously great grandfather, Adam. That's where he got our sin nature from. Jesus Christ did not have a physical father. Now, he is in the third chapter of Luke, the genealogy of Mary goes back to Adam, but once again, Jesus didn't have a human father. And his, his conception and his uh, term inside of Mary, nine months, and his birth, not affected by sin in any way. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so we have this miraculous virgin birth sinless Savior, lamb without spot or blemish. Well, how can he understand our sin then if he never sinned? When he hung on the cross, he who knew no sin became sin, became the sin offering for us. In that, as the God-man hanging on the cross, he experienced every sorrow, every, every heartache, every burden, every thing that you experience in life. So he understands all about sin, though he himself never sinned. Got to understand that. Because there have been people in the last, count them, two or three years on national news who have said very controversially that, well, Jesus was a sinner. People on national news. If I, if I watch national news, which I don't, I would not watch national news anymore after that. That would be it. I would be through with it. Because no one's going to go on there and get paid millions of dollars and I'm indirectly aiding and abetting his getting a big salary if that man could stand up there and say that Jesus was a sinner. Oh, I'll just tell you, his name's Don Lemon. He said that Jesus was a sinner. I would not watch him one second if I did watch news. That's wrong. And I hope he's found out he was wrong and he's repented of it. But you can't get away with that. Jesus Christ is the sinless Son of God. A lot of people have said terrible things about our Savior and about Mary, his mother. She was called every dirty word you can think of because it wasn't obvious to people how this baby got here. It wasn't apparent uh, that he had been born of a virgin. Instead, they they thought that Mary was a loose uh, living person. And so she got called bad names. And Jesus, I'm sure, got called bad names and so forth. So we, we know that this was the case. So boys and girls, young people, adults, I want you to know, first of all, who Jesus is. And then I want you to know that he wants to be in your life and he wants to make a difference. And if Jesus Christ uh, could go through what he did, and uh, be victorious, then we can be victorious in and through Jesus Christ as well. It says in verse 26 of that same chapter, and in the sixth month, that's the sixth month of cousin Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. At no time then or any other time is she called the queen of heaven. 
Is she uh, given uh, credit for uh, being the mother of God? Uh, is she ever said to be sinless herself, virgin born herself, or uh, uh, to be the co-mediatrix or the co-redemptrix with Jesus Christ? Now, those are all lies taught by traditional religion. So not all churches are the same. There are religions out there that will teach you that Mary is the queen of heaven, that Mary is the mother of God. Well, she's the mother of Jesus Christ, but she's not the mother of God. And, and so that's a false, a false title. And it is said that she is, by, by religion, that she is the co-mediatrix. She's the mediator along with, uh, with Jesus. So you can pray, they say, to Mary as well as to Jesus. And because Mary is the mother of Jesus, well, she'll go take care of things for you. You know, she'll get it taken care of. The Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So Jesus is the only mediator. Mary's not the co-mediatrix. And she's definitely not the co-redemptrix. Now that is being promoted. It's not official dogma yet. But they're going to come to that point when some head of that false religion, worldwide religion, will stand up and say, we have now uh, determined, and he'll be speaking what, he, what they call ex cathedra. He'll have that in his hand, that thing on his head. And he'll be say, saying, she's actually co-redeemer, redemptrix, along with Jesus Christ. No, she's not. She was just like you and I am. She is a sinner that was saved by grace, a wonderful woman chosen by God, and she was the vessel through whom Jesus Christ came. And it was all announced. It was all prearranged. Praise the Lord for that. Now, not everybody understood it. Now, she had uh, an espoused, or uh, this is a little stronger than engagement, person in her life. Uh, in those days, in Bible times, People were promised to other people for marriage long before they were of marriageable age. So a family would get together and say, you know, in most cases, you know, if they can stand each other, well, so-and-so will marry so-and-so when they get old enough. And that's, that's just the way that culture was. That's not our culture, but that was their culture. And in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, Matthew, back to the first gospel, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So this is saying that even though they were espoused, that means stronger than engagement. An espousal, I mean, they had already started talking about, oh, marriage plans, um, you know, finances, where they're going to live, they might have a house built. Uh, even the, the young man might come to live in the house of the young lady or vice versa, but there's no physical contact between them until after they're married. So a spousal is like engagement, only stronger. It was so strong that for you to break an espousal was not like just saying, well, our, the engagement's off, give me back the ring. It didn't work like that. For an espousal to be broken, you had to go to the high priest and get a paper written up that was like a divorce paper. You had to actually get divorced if you're going to break an engagement and a spousal in Bible times. That's pretty serious stuff. So they had to be really, really, really sure about it. And so when it became known that this child was on the way, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Now, privily means privately. He's a nice guy, but he's a godly guy. He's a no compromise, compromise, compromise kind of guy. He knows what the law is, and he knows that if he got really, really upset about this and let his old nature run the show, why, he could demand that Mary be stoned to death because it appeared that she'd been unfaithful. But he was a nice guy. He was going to put her away privily. He was going to have this divorce paper. But while he thought on these things, and he must have been thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking, and it must have been really bothering him. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. She hasn't been unfaithful. 
What's inside of her came from God. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name, what? Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus means Savior. So that's to be his name. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. That's the prophet Isaiah saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. So there it is. The angel visits Mary, visits Joseph, and now the stage is set. Now the Lord is going to do something really, really amazing. And how many of you don't like to pay the government extra taxes? Raise your hands. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to turn you in. We don't like to pay extra taxes. And when they start more and more and more and more and more, I'd like to have some more say in how they're spending the money up there. But um, this is an occasion when God moves on the heart of an unsaved world ruler to tax a bunch of people to get folks into position so that Scripture will be fulfilled. Luke chapter 2, please. Go to Luke chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. God had done that. He moved on the heart of, of this unsaved world ruler. And in order to do that, in verse 3, they all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. So you have to go down to wherever your ancestors came from Wherever that is, you have to go back to the old hometown, the old homestead, and you have to register and pay your taxes. That meant, look at me, that meant Mary and Joseph, and she's great with child now. She's, she's out here. That means they're up here in Galilee, and they've got to travel all the way down here to Judea. And she's great with child. Now, those of you who know anything about the process, you know, that's not a good thing. Get on a beast of burden, get on a mule or some beast of burden and travel it, all those roads. They didn't have any super highways. Roads in those days were just paths at best. Now the Roman roads were, were well built and there were some of those around the empire. But this, this was a rough way to go and there were thieves and robbers and difficulties and it would take several days to go from way up here to way down here. Think about that. And Joseph also went up from Galilee. Now, I know it says up, but it's up in elevation. It's not up on the map. The map, you know, north, south, you know how it is. Okay, well, it's down on the map, but it's up in elevation because down there near Jerusalem, everything's kind of mountainous or it's on hills. So he went up. He went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, uh, into Judea, way down here, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. It means house of bread. Because he was of the house and lineage of David. Both he and Mary had come through the line of David. They both had royal blood in that, that respect. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. We're going to talk about that in the morning service today. The old story is still absolutely true. The baby Jesus is born, laid in a manger on cloth that has a special designation. We'll see after a while. He came to seek and to save the lost. As much as we love to sing about the baby Jesus and we're glad he came, the baby Jesus, if that's all there ever was, could not save us. For without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And the shedding of the blood of our adult Savior, Jesus Christ, had to be accomplished voluntarily. And this would be uh, 33 years later, he would die in our place. He would shed his blood. He would, he would be buried. He would rise from the dead. He came to die. He came to rise from the dead. He came to be our Savior. That's what this is all about. Christmas is definitely not about some fat guy on the roof or a bunch of reindeer or snowmen that magically come to life and, you know, before they melt away. But Christmas is about the truth. And the truth is, without a Savior, we're going to go to hell. And we need Jesus Christ, who's the only one that qualifies as Savior, because he was, was he a sinner or was he sinless? 
sinless. That's right. So he's the lamb. He's the innocent lamb that comes to, to live, to, to die, to be buried, to rise from the dead, to save us. That's what this is all about. And the first people who came to see, to, to visit him, there in the manger, were not the three wise men. First of all, we don't know how many wise men there were. I asked the other night some folks, how many wise men were there? They said three. I said, no, there were three gifts. Only tradition says there were three or four with, you know, the one being lost. You know, Johnny come lately, whatever his name was. Ga Gaspar, whatever his name is. Baltazar, whatever. I forget what his name was. Anyway, uh, that's a made-up story. And these wise men came from the east, and they were uh, astronomers, not astrologers, but astronomers who watched the movement of the stars, and they had access to the great library of the east. And in the great library of the east were writings, such great books as Daniel, the Pentateuch, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. These were all in the, the great library. So they were, they were expecting something to happen, someone to come. And so they followed. And we don't know how many hundred there were, but they did not arrive at the manger. They didn't even arrive late at the manger. When they arrived, they arrived where Mary and Joseph had now uh, rented, apparently, a house. They were staying in a house. And they came in, in in Matthew chapter 2 and fell down and worshiped not Mary, not the holy family, but the young child. Different concept entirely. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which represents a lot. We'll get to that uh, in a future lesson. But today, the ones who came to the manger were the humble shepherds. The angel appeared, then the heavenly host appeared, and they spoke and sang, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And they came with haste, and they found them. And then the Bible says, When they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. All of these comprise what we call the Christmas story, the manger scene and all the surrounding individuals and events that had to do with the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm glad He came. How miserable we would be. We were talking this morning about what a rough state of affairs things are in the world right now and the kind of leadership we've got and so forth. And We went back a few years and they said, yeah, what if this and what if this and a few years back, what if this and what if this and a few years back and what if this and what if this. Finally concluded, you know what? Without Jesus, we have no hope. Without Jesus, we are in a state of despair. And he's the one who breaks that hopeless despair into a billion pieces, trillion pieces, and gives us hope and is our peace. Praise God for Jesus Christ. Thank God that he came, and on this Christmas Sunday, it is right for us to celebrate. So when we are through here in just a few moments, we're going to talk some more about why it's right to celebrate. But certainly, Jesus is what? The reason for the season. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes, please? Every You've head been bowed, viewing a service at Central Baptist Church. We never dismiss the service without clearly presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, that Jesus came to this earth and sinlessly lived for 33 years before he voluntarily gave his life. He died on the cross. He was buried he rose from the dead, and he's alive forevermore. Through the shedding of his blood and through his victory at uh, the, the empty tomb, Jesus Christ now offers salvation to you. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray right now from your heart to God and ask him to save you? Something like this, Dear God, 
Just pray, dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve to pay for my sins. I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus died to save me. I believe Jesus died to save me. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Did you pray that prayer? Did you mean it? Wonderful. I want you to get in contact with us and let us know of your decision. Now, if you've already been saved, I want to encourage you to live the life that God would have you to live according to His Word. If you desire more instruction, more information, we'll be happy to supply it to you. We like to talk to you. The information is right here, and we'd love to speak to you. If you have any spiritual needs whatsoever, may God bless you.